you've got to stand out. You've got to separate yourself somehow. Business of Architecture, episode 408. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm Enoch Sears. Today, you'll hear a recording from our Shaper Network, which is our exclusive internal group of small firm owners here at Business of Architecture. You'll hear a recording of a live event with that we did with the leadership team at Mancini Duffy, an innovative design firm that has been previously featured here on the Business of Architecture podcast. We've had both the president, Christian Giordano, on the podcast, as well as Bolanli Williams Ole, she's the CFO. On this recording, you'll hear both Christian and Bolanli, as well as Bill Mandara, who's the CEO, Scott Harrell, the principal, and Jessica Mann Amato, who's also a principal at the firm. On this recording, you'll hear how these leaders share how they took Mancini Duffy out of a culture slump, created a business structure that lasts, focused on mentoring, maintaining legacy, also while implementing an effective succession plan within the firm. Business of Architecture Shaper Network members were able to have their questions answered around firm composition, leadership structure, incentive compensation, and more. I hope you enjoy this special recording from Business of Architecture Shaper Network. And with that, here is today's show. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. So we're going to have a a conversation here with uh, Mancini Duffy. Mancini Duffy are a practice based in New York. uh, The actual history of the practice, you guys are how old? 107 years old? Yep. Yep. And um, massively innovative practice. I've had Christian on the show before and Bolanle as well and they've been some of the most interesting guests and as you guys know I'm often dropping references about Mancini Duffy all the time one of the things I often talk about is your the business acumen and the leadership and I remember when I was when I was talking to Christian and and Bolanle about how you guys are incredibly transparent with all of your kind of your goal setting your mission your values and you have a quarterly meeting with the rest of the office where you actually discuss these things and show what your objectives are and this has created a quite a unique environment of of you know an entrepreneurial culture and even an entrepreneurial culture where you guys have actually had uh, members of your team who have set up their own kind of businesses within inside of Mancini Duffy so I think perhaps why don't we start there and I'll, I'll open this out to all all five of you um how did that culture start coming about what was the and how did you begin to create it i mean i'll take a stab it's pretty organically though it wasn't something that was contrived necessarily um it's really just an extension of all of how we are and what we believe in yeah, and I, I just to say that you know that sort of the the monthly meeting came about where when actually, you know, we stepped into the leadership role of the firm, the firm really wasn't in all that great shape uh, in terms of the types of projects that we were getting, but then even the design we were putting out or uh, or even on the financial end. And what we started doing was having these, you know, all-in staff meetings to try and boost morale. And celebrating, you know, sort of the smallest little victories. Hey, we won this kind of project, and look at that, we won that project. And it started to create this culture of, you know, this all-in meeting once a month, um, which then eventually became, uh, you know, we decided, well, we needed to actually have an agenda for it eventually, and it became a way of talking about the firm very openly and transparently about whether that was an issue at the firm or financial issues or, or not not issues, but but being open about all of the, the various aspects of running a, a running an architecture firm and and getting everybody involved in that um, in that getting excited about it. 
I think also because we are so transparent, there's this unique culture where people feel very open and willing to discuss what their career goals are and how they want to grow with the firm. So people are always coming to us with ideas for research and development. And, you know, as you mentioned, the two different divisions of the company that we founded. Um, so it's a, it's a culture that encourages people to come forward with ideas. Great. Now, how, how, uh, Christian, I know your story into leadership. How did everybody else's role begin to emerge? And perhaps we could, we could kind of go start with Jessica and move our way across um, about what your, how would you describe your role in Mancini Duffy? So I'm the design principal. I oversee interiors for the firm. And my role really is workplace strategy and interior design. So I help form the teams to work on workplace strategy and interiors for every project within the firm. And I'm really kind of creatively curating the teams to provide the best design and the best result for the client and bolstering the client relationships, you know, from the start of workplace strategy all the way through the completion of the project. Ah, so, so Jessica, were you the one that started the interiors team up and... Kind of that was your your initiative, and it's and that, that's one of these departments that's kind of its own business within inside of Mancini. So we we kind of run across the whole firm and and touch a little bit of everything that we do. I I did not start the department, but I have um, pushed the department quite a bit. Right. Um, I sure. came on board. <laughs> she didn't start it, but she's finishing it. <laughs> <laughs> I came on board a few years ago, and I've really embraced technology throughout my whole career. So in line with our design lab and our tool belt program, we've really taken what we do from an interiors perspective and pushed the envelope farther than any other place that I've ever worked. Do you want me to talk? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so I'm Christian. Uh, yeah, I'm the president of the firm, um, but really my day-to-day -day role is, I would describe it as I'm kind of the head cheerleader. You know, want to get everybody motivated and kind of set us on the on the track of you know what we're doing tomorrow, what we're doing in a year from now, what we're doing five years from now. Um, really, what are some of the the business avenues we want to go down in terms of where are the, where are the market sectors we want to get into? Where are the additional offices we want to open up around the, the United States and then ultimately around the world? Um, what is the design? What is the vision for the firm from a, from a design point of view, but then also from a uh, from a business this point of view. Uh, but my day-to-day -day job, quite frankly, is going out and having relationships and meeting people and, and uh, hopefully bringing uh, work in the door so that we can you know, keep all this great momentum that we've started uh, continuing on for many, many years to come. Brilliant. Thank you. Rolandle. Sure. Hi, everyone. Really nice to be here with you all and my partners. Um, I am the Chief Financial Officer here at Mancini, and my job literally is in the title of my role. Um, I'm responsible for the financial success of the company, which trickles down to our projects, trickles down to how we run our firm day to day. But outside of that, my other main job is truly being a strategic partner to our CEO, who will introduce himself later on. Uh, Bill and I work hand in hand every single day to make sure that firm operations, um, not just financial, but HR, IT, marketing, um, all that you can think about when it comes to running a firm runs smoothly. Um, my other main role also is really to integrate the accounting and finance team with the project management team. Um, we really are a critical member uh, of the project team, so not just a, an add-on or people that you just talk to once a month but truly your eyes and ears from a numbers perspective, helping you ask the right, helping you understand what your numbers are telling you so that you can then run your projects really well. That's great, brilliant, Scott. Hi, I'm Scott. So I feel like I've been here the longest, so I started with Mancini Duffy before any of these great people have joined the company, so I feel like the, the young dinosaur of the company. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm a principal and co-owner here, and, you know, kind of my, my role is to kind of keep ongoing client relationships. I've had a lot of relationships from my past that, you know, I've carried over into the firm, and, 
continue to maintain those relationships for over 18, 20 years now and just working with those clients. So, you know, keeping client relationships and, and maintaining new ones too and bringing down new work for the, for the firm. All right, thank you. Cool. So, yeah, Bola kind of started <laughs> off over there. Um, I'm Bill, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the company. I have a few different roles, primarily operations, though. As Bola and I spent a lot of time together, as she mentioned, to make sure that, you know, it's my responsibility to really make sure that the firm is operating properly, that, you know, things like staffing are taken care of, um, a lot of the day-to-day. -day. I'm also the um, signatory architect for the firm, so... Basically, every set, of, every set of drawings in the that goes out of our office has my name and stamp on it, which is, you know, it's fantastic when you have, you know, a house and things like that that you want to worry about and <laughs> people that rely on you. To, like, so it's, you know, make sure and making sure everything is done properly and, um, you know, from a technical standpoint as well. Um, and then my other job is to be the anvil to Christian's balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, uh, Bill came with the furniture, by the way, just so you know. Uh, so the firm actually did acquire, Mancini acquired a firm probably now going back 15 years ago, and Bill worked there, and we always joke, Bill, Bill came with the furniture. Yeah, I, 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 one of these days, if I could stand being outside and camping, I'd go on Survivor, because I'm pretty sure I would crush it. <laughs> yeah, it's the only, one, only one left. I definitely am one Survivor New York City edition. Brilliant. So in the, the, the practice, the firm's obviously got a very long history and is now entering into a, you know, the very, a very new generation. And you guys have been quite amazing with your um, the way that you've been broadcasting yourselves over the last few four months um, and restructuring the whole practice. Um, what was what were some of the first things that you needed to consider? How did this restructuring come about? How do you take a company that's got 107 years of of history and make sure that it's still at the cutting edge, if you like, or you know, for a 21st century design firm? Sure. I mean, I can take that question where in terms of the structuring, and I think we touched upon this a little bit in the episode that you and I had done, um, uh, you know, probably about a year ago or so. Uh, the, the restructuring really came about out of the fact that I had came over to the firm uh, from, from my previous firm to let's, let's, for all intents and purposes, say breathe new life into this, you know, older architecture firm. And kind of one thing leading to another, the previous ownership, um, you know, was really about at retirement age. And they really talked about, you know, getting ready to retire. And it was sort of out there on the table a lot. And it was really, you know, myself who I went to Bill and to Scott and said, listen, we have an opportunity here to buy the firm from the previous ownership. They are looking to retire. They mention it a lot. Um, and they, they basically told me to come back with a plan to how we were going to buy them out. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, myself, Scott, and, and Bill came up with a plan of purchasing the firm um, actually personally from the ownership directly. So it wasn't something where the firm gifted us shares or um, you know, wrote us a note where it said, okay, now you own the firm. We actually, you know, dug into our pockets and paid them over a, a period of time. Um, uh, for me, it was uh, five years, and for, for uh, uh, Bill and Scott, it was basically about the same, or three years, something three years like that. Old. It's over now. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what, like, me and my wife care about, is it's over. <laughs> but then in structuring that deal, we also determined that there's a lot of ownership, uh, there's a lot of shares, the way that this company is, is actually structured. It's an S corporation, uh, therefore the shares, there is a certain defined amount of shares. Those shares, we then said, okay, well, let's take some of those shares and put them away for future ownership. And that's where then uh, Bola and Jessica come into the picture a few years down the road where we knew we needed to obviously have a, a, a security in, on the finance side and leadership on the finance side. And then on the design side with Jessica, we needed a powerhouse on the design side to come in and we wanted you know, them to have ownership. We did it the same way where everybody's put in their own money and in that case, they, you know, Bola and, and Jessica bought it directly from the firm. 
Um, but that's our motto going forward. And we still actually have shares in the treasury for sort of the next generation of, of ownership um, that you know they can ultimately buy into the firm as well. So that's kind of structurally how that transition began. And then I'll let these guys uh, kind of take it from the from the other the other end. Yeah. So I mean, you kind of said it all. But yeah, this Christian comes to me. I was actually I was actually ready to leave the firm before Christian came here because I, <laughs> I, I like he mentioned, I was with a firm that was acquired, and I was like. Argh. Um, and Christian did come with this idea, and my first thought was like, you're nuts. Um, and then, you know, here we are. It turns out it worked. And I think that um, we've been very fortunate to put this group together. Like, I can tell you, like, like Bola kind of said, I, I cannot possibly imagine doing my job without Bola here to compliment me. And I think that as a group, we, uh, you know, we're all kind of rowing in the same direction, and, and we all have our clear vision for the future. Yeah, and I could say, you know, you know, I have a unique perspective on it too, right? Because I came from Legacy Mancini Duffy, right? And that transition to, you know, working with the original Mancini Duffy team and, and transitioning into this new leadership team, you, you get to see a lot of what happened and how it happened and how it evolved. And I think I'll add to that, right? So um, when you think about um, the legacy of the the firm and how we have now sort of started building our own legacy, I would say we've taken uh, a startup approach to it. It's a very startup-y mentality um, with how we diversify the industries that we're going to, what we say yes to when our employees come to, you know, give us pitch their big, bold ideas, you know, um, how, we, how we communicate financial information, how we're transparent, how we're trying to build community with our people. It's vastly different, I would say, from um, uh, early Mancini, but we appreciate that legacy. It's given us sort of a, a head start in the industry, right? It's a, a company that's well known. It's just that now we have way more things to talk about with, like the design lab, how we're using technology to really change, um, you know, how we're designing and our approach, right? So I'm appreciative of having the 100 plus years prior, uh, before us, but then what do we really want? What do the five of us really want to be known for, right? Um, what are we adding to that legacy? So it's important for us to, to keep charting and, and figuring that out as we, as we move forward. And the thing that we're talking about all the time is finding our replacements, you know, training people from within so that they're able to grow within the firm so that we can continue to grow and then they're replacing us in our roles. So that's really one of the most important things about this is that you're always mentoring the people underneath you and continuing to grow. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out there. We, we're learning every day as a leadership group. Um, we do not pretend that we have all the answers. We are very transparent when we kind of come to a conclusion or a solution or if we've encountered a problem. And every single day is a learning experience for us. We're, we're all not, with the exception of Bola, we're all not really oh. <laughs> uh, business people in that sense, right? We're using our, our intuition, we're using what we think is best, um, and then using our past experience. And you know, the past 10 years have been a great learning experience. I know for me personally, there's a lot of things that I did you know, 10 years ago that I probably wouldn't do now. And every day, it sort of it, it it changes along the way. I mean, even to you know, we we just moved our office in Manhattan, um, and that was a learning experience. None of us had ever moved an office before, and it turns out what an undertaking that was. Um, it's been a, been been quite a, quite a thing. No one teaches you that um, in in leadership training or in schooling when you go to architecture school. That's for sure. When you were kind of looking at the, the practice, your newly acquired firm, if you like, what was the process that you went through to audit what you would keep of the legacy Mancini Duffy and what and creating a new vision for it? Uh, you know, I think that a lot of it happened, like I mentioned before, very organically um, because we had been there for a while. Um, Scott had been there for the longest. Me and then, you know, Christian and I came in right around the same amount of time. So... We were there for a, good, a few years before we actually started the transition, and then the transition did take some time too. So there was enough time where um, you know we were able to identify the, the, the pieces that were working, the pieces that were, weren't working, and you know really who the who who, who, who was going to be able to take us to that next level and who the people were. Yeah, 
Part of that also is an ongoing strategy and discovery with ourselves. So we're constantly reassessing what's working well, what we need to improve upon. So we have visioning sessions with our, our core leadership team and all of the tiers of leaders underneath us. And we're constantly looking at how we need to adapt our vision moving forward. So about every three years, we reassess our strategic plan and you know realign with, with how we need to adapt and grow. And how and how does the, how is the office structured underneath, if you like? So from the from the leadership downwards, what's the kind of hierarchy in the in the firm? So we have you know we have we have our ownership group here, and then we have a leadership group that ownership is part of as well that that is um, includes other members, including studio leaders and different folks, and there's representation from um, you know other parts of the firm as well. And including research and development and marketing, so really, like it all comes, it, it all kind of stems from that leadership group out, and it's just identifying who those people are, and then how we can put them on the right track to get them where they need to be. Yeah, but then it's it's teams, and yeah. and within the team, there are studios, and then within the studios, there are teams, and even that, quite frankly, we're constantly organizing, and not not necessarily reorganizing, but constantly adapting because as we grow. Um, you know, those studios have evolved. We've also added other market sectors that we've never worked in before um, that are now, you know, what we, we started doing restaurant design, what, two years ago maybe? Two years ago, and, and we're doing a ton of restaurants right now, and, you know, probably upwards of 20 restaurants when it's all said and done from various stages. And, you know, that's an entire new vertical market that we've had to create. And so now that kind of shifts again in our studio practice and which studio does the restaurants? Is it a mix of studios? Is it individuals within studios? And we're balancing that out as more and more work comes in for that. When you're making those moves into new sectors, how do you um, decide upon which route to go down? Is there who who's doing the research, if you like, into okay? I think this is a good sector, or again, is it is it more organic? <laughs> I, I would love to say that there's uh, some sort of you know research that goes into it, but I think a lot of what we're doing is it's relationship driven. Yeah. And you know, if we're trusted by a client to do one thing, and they realize we have the ability to do maybe another thing then that's kind of how we begin to grow. If it's someone within the firm, and we talked a little bit about this in an earlier episode, you know, if it's someone within the firm that has an idea of a market sector that, that they want to get into, um, they come with a, for, for all intents and purposes, a business plan presented to us and say, okay, these are the kind of, this is the, 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 the market I'd like to see us get into. Um, we're, we're dabbling in it in this sense, and maybe we can, you know, parlay that into more and more work. And what happens, so that happened with our airport work. It's happened with restaurant work. We're actually now doing uh, work on in cannabis, uh, from grow facilities to, uh, to um, uh, dispensaries. And we have someone that has stepped up recently and said, you know, I really would like to be the market leader in this sector. Um, you know, how can I do that? And so now knowing we have a leader, you know, I go out and really try to you know, bolster the relationships that we have and try and win more work. And, and so it, it's a very much a natural evolution. If there, are, if there are things that we know we should get into because the market is right for it, um, like industrial. Uh, industrial is one where the market in the United States and uh, you know, in the suburbs, the industrial market is booming. Um, that's something that we've specifically gone out and sought after clients and people. Um, not everyone at the firm wants to work on an industrial project, right? It's a, it's a different kind of animal. It's very different from doing a high-end restaurant, to doing a high-end interiors. So we've got to have the staff that you know, wants to work on that kind of work. Uh, or multifamily residential. It's something we've dabbled in that we know, you know, this is really an, a market sector that we really need to pursue further. And so now we're making strides in that, in that area, in that market sector to really try to now go and actively seek out that work and win it. And I think for us from a financial perspective, right, by the time we do one, two, three different projects, we see you know, how did the project perform? What is the project profitability? Is there something, is there something really there from a numbers perspective? And if there is, then, you know, we keep on 
like Christian said, building the relationships within um, that sector. So they're not just off <laughs> um, chasing these, you know, new shiny things, but then we're also looking at it from a financial perspective to make sure that it makes sense. Um, to keep on, um, you know, looking at projects within that, the new sectors that we're exploring. It's also about insulating ourselves a little bit with diversity of client types and project types. Mm -hmm. In 2008, I worked at a firm and like 80% of our clients were financial services. So you can guess how that went. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> I think also one of the reasons we're so successful in growing into new market sectors is because of the way that we work with our clients. They really become an integral part of our team and they become immersed in our process. So we, we don't have a lot of ego. We tell them that we're very happy and excited to explore this journey with them and to learn alongside them. Restaurants is a perfect example. When we got into restaurant design, we had only designed a few restaurants, but we wanted to go on that journey and it was a market sector we really wanted to get into. So we have some great clients that went on that journey with us, became an integral part of our team. And the restaurant business is booming because of how successful that relationship has been with those initial clients that decided they wanted to go on that journey with us. So I think because of our no ego and because the way we approach design with the clients, it's an enticing um, exploration for them as well. And oddly enough, our restaurant sector really took off like right around COVID started, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which you would think would be the exact opposite, but here we are. Yeah, now they, uh, they, they, they're getting government money to expand, so, you know. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Great. So I, th I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the, the questions here to our audience. I'm sure oh. they've got lots of, lots of questions for you. So I know it's Jonathan, you had your hand up. You still have a question? Yeah. Well, it was an accident that I had my hand up, but I did have a question. <laughs> uh, so looking at your firm composition, I see you, you're kind of low 50s in terms of your staff, and you got about 25 people identified as some kind of associate up to C-suite type people. Seems kind of top heavy to me, but I'm curious how that works for you and, and what the, maybe you're on the front end of that and trying to grow to, to build out that leadership structure, but I'm curious about those numbers and how they work. Yeah, so I just... Uh, it, on the website, isn't necessarily up to date with everybody that's at the firm. So there are there's a whole round of updates coming. We're also in the in the uh, process of making an acquisition of another firm, um, so also bolstering us. But but yeah, I mean, Bill, you want to take kind of how we how we structure it out? Yeah. So I mean, listen, we would, there's there's a few things there, right? What we don't want to do is is you know, it, well, first of all, it's important to have that right leadership group in place. If you don't have a good coaching staff, you're going to have a horrible team, right? So we have to have that all established as we grow the team, and we also want to have the right leaders who are going to, you know, they're they're going to help define the type of staff and the type of teammates they want to have on their team as well. And and the other thing I would add to that is that you know we have been actively promoting people as well because what we don't want to do is let um, let, let a thing like COVID or, or something like that get in the way of anybody's career path. We want everybody to be able to realize their uh, career path regardless of the circumstances. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, just, just on that, you mentioned um, you're in the process at the moment of acquisition and you mentioned earlier that was how um, Will came into the, the company. Is that, is that a, a kind of strategy that you use for entering into new sectors? quite often is acquisition or is this a new thing? This will be the first time for us as a group in terms of an acquisition that we're, we're looking to make. And it will actually bring us into uh, two specific market sectors um, that we don't have any uh, practice area at all in. And so that's really, it's a strategic move uh, on our part. And, and so we're excited to kind of see, you know, we're working actually through this process now and integrating that company into our company. Um, and in probably about two months, we'll, we'll come out with, you know, the press release as to who it is and, and, you know, all that good stuff. And having been on the, the wrong end of an acquisition, I know exactly how to not do it. So we've been, <laughs> those have been very valuable lessons that uh, we're, we're, we're carrying forth. I, I, I imagine it's a very sensitive process where obviously kind of making sure that the cultural alignment is, is there and again, the high level of transparency that would be involved between you and the existing employees of that company, how they get integrated or 
hundred percent. Everybody has to know that they have an opportunity to grow and that it's not, you know, this is not going to be something that's going to be a barrier to growth. It's actually going to help them get to where they want to be. Yeah. And I know often business brokers are very keen to have things done as fast as possible and not necessarily keep that level. You may or may not get compensated based on when things are, (laughs) you know. Great. Thank you. Mark. So, Mark, um, as you ask a question, do you want to just introduce yourself and let and, and let the panel here know where you are in the world and a little bit about your own practice so then it gives a little bit of context? Sure. I'm Mark Elster, one of the founders of a small firm in Seattle, Washington. There's six of us currently, and I'm in the process of engineering an ownership change as my partner approaches retirement. My question for you is, I was intrigued by the notion of reserving shares. Currently, the partnership divides the shares between themselves, and when someone new comes on, then we re-dilute the shares to reflect the current ownership structure. We haven't really considered reserving shares, so I'm wondering, when you restructured the business, how many shares did you reserve for the ownership, and how much did you reserve for associates and junior associates and so forth? I would say we probably initially reserved about 20%, yeah. maybe 25%, or so, somewhere around in there. I'd have to look at the... There's 42,000 shares available right. based on our bylaws. And this was, you know, we kind of inherited a, you know, the bylaws and, and all hey, We're, we're an S corporation, so that's a little bit... There's certain, you know, practicalities towards that. Yeah, and so we determined, all right, well, if we hold it, this chunk back, right, it was enough... Our concern was, is it enough for myself, Scott, and, and, and Bill to, you know, essentially buy out the, the current leadership? And they obviously wanted to be paid in, in full based on the agreement that we came to. And, and the way that we did our valuation um, was kind of interesting, right? We, we did a valuation three different methods. Uh, one was a, what, what, what was called a book valuation, which there is a way that an architecture firm is valued. We had an independent person come uh, and do a valuation that we paid them uh, a lot of money. I think it was like 20 grand to do a valuation. It seems like a waste of money at the time. Uh, and then um, we... <laughs> We pay, and then we did a the AIA version of um, uh, there was another version that Tony had had that he did, and essentially it all kind of came out to about the same, and we averaged it out, and it was a very very uh, you know cordial and positive negotiation with the previous owners, um, with us where it was you know they wanted us to succeed, they didn't want it to be a burden on us you know personally. They obviously wanted the value that they saw ultimately to get in the end, but they were willing to take it over a period of years, which, you know, obviously we're, we're very grateful that they were to do that. It made it quite practical um, for them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. How are those shares, um, you know, if, if employees now want to become on the leadership track, what do they need to what do they need to do how does that process work I want to take that me <laughs> I'll take it uh, so honestly we're, we're figuring that out um, you know we've actually approached we've, we've spoken to some of the the newest leadership here uh, about what that track means um, and how we would ultimately roll that out so for us it's going to be a period of years where you know they will begin to buy in over time, uh, and then at some point when you know some of us here are ready to begin to shed some of our uh, our shares, we'll start selling it to them so that it becomes a more balanced, um, you know, equitable ownership structure. Great. Now. When we were talking last time, you, you mentioned about the, the kind of one-page business plan. And again, this is a, another kind of idea that's stuck in my head and has become very memorable. Um, could you remind, or for people who don't know what it is, could you tell us a little bit about what that one-page business plan is, what it looks like, and why you use it? 
I mean, it's literally one piece of paper, that, you know, <laughs> you, uh, you know, listen, we, like Christian mentioned before, I mean, we, you know, I went to school for architecture and they didn't really teach you a heck of a lot about business. What I know about business, I either learned from my father or from, you know, doing it here. Um, so we did have a business coach for quite a while that introduced us to, to some of these things, including the one page plan, which were, you know, some of the things you do is you list your, your goals for the next year, three years, five years, um, you know, and you, you it has certain categories in there that you keep on there that are really quite simple that keep you goal minded on what, what you know what's what, what's the prize um, and then how you're going to get there. But it's literally a format. Yeah, and I think um, the beauty about the one page uh, business plan is that it removes all fluff. Right, you get straight to the point. What are your financial goals for the year? What are your um, uh, staff slash you know, employee engagement slash people goals for the year. And you have to remember, again, for me, I can probably sit there and look at financial um, sheets that are, are many pages on, but I'm working with architects and designers. And so I have to be able to deliver information in ways you guys understand. As Bill rightly said, you didn't go to school for... To, to learn how to run a business, you went to design. And so I think people, a lot of times, even if your business plan is not one page, I love the one page, if it's two pages, just make sure that the information you have on there is how you understand it. You're the one running your business. Think about the key metrics that are important for you to track throughout the year and make sure that's what's on there. You don't need to have 15 pages worth of stuff that you're never going to look at. The one-page business plan means you can literally save it on your phone, screensaver. You can have it on your computer. You can have it printed out. But it's your goals top and center in one page. It's easy to conflate a lot of words with uh, substance, and this kind of takes that out of it, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how, mu how much, uh, how close then are lots of the sort of project architects and people who aren't in leadership, how close are they to the numbers of the business? Are they, are they aware? Of what oh, yeah. the turnover is, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, as Christian mentioned, typically at the start of the year, we share what the firm wide year, year goal is. And as the year rolls out, we are updating um, how we're progressing towards the goals that we've set. I think it's really important because it, it one, your employees feel like they're, you're carrying them along. They know what's happening. We are sharing both wins and, and, and losses, right? Projects that we're going after that we don't either get. We're sharing all that information with them. And I think they appreciate it. They appreciate um, just the transparency that comes, comes out of these meetings. And then when we get towards the end of the year, there's something to celebrate, right? You've been a part of it throughout the year. I think um, it's critical for employee buy-in. If, you, if you're not sharing this information as the year is rolling out, then they're just working in a vacuum and they don't understand the importance of their role and, and how it flows into the, the larger picture. That transparency also go down, goes down to the project level. So everyone working on that project understands what the fee of the project is and how their individual billable rate affects the time that they're spending on the project and ultimately affects the fee. And so I think that helps people be accountable for not only the time that they're spent on the project, but also understanding how we produce what we need to produce within that time frame. So the transparency really filters all the way down through the company into every specific project. Was, was that a, uh, something that was part of the legacy Mancini Duffy, that transparency, or was that a relatively new, a new thing? It was not. <laughs> I can tell you firsthand it was definitely not. <laughs> it, it wasn't, but to Jessica's point, I mean, even you know, even an intern architect working on it, 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 it and what Paula said too, it's it's good for them to know that their time has meaning not only on the project but on the you know the greater cause of the firm and growing the business. Was there any worries or concerns about opening up and being that transparent? Because this is something I no, hear when I speak to <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's a lot of concerns about it. Um, and, and, and I was probably the most reticent to this approach initially, um, not because I don't believe in transparency, but, you know, there's, it's a lot of information for somebody, you know, especially, you know, an intern architect of, you know, maybe 25 years old to take in. 
Um, and it's like, hey, we didn't meet our goal. You know, they need to understand that doesn't mean the firm is closing tomorrow and they don't have a job. It just needs that we need to recalibrate a bit. Um, but ultimately, it was the absolute right decision to uh, to share that with folks. It also it it also has a you know if we say hey we we brought in you know nineteen million dollars twenty million dollars this past year, um, it can have an effect. Well, well then maybe the you know I can get a raise for this amount and maybe I can do this. So we've also had to talk about this is the revenue that the firms brought in, this is the profit that the firms brought in, and this is what we're doing with those things in terms of investing in technology, investing in more people, investing in this. It's not a big pot of money that at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy a Lamborghini with um, so or that, that we're all going on a vacation together. It really is, you know, what are we doing with that money to help the firm grow and how do we continue to, to do that so it's a risk on kind of both ends of you know hey we're doing really well or hey we're not doing so well you can you have to find that balance somewhere uh, in between and and again it's something we've tweaked the message as we've gone um, but we're still we're still doing it yeah, and I, I think also to that point is that you know being transparent like that helps the staff trust us as leadership, right? If we're sharing that information with them, it helps them trust us. It's like, hey, we're being upfront with them, we're being honest, this is where the big, this is the big picture. And, and so it really helps that way. And also helps them understand the business of design and architecture, which I think so many firms don't really teach people how the business actually runs. I think it's very beneficial for them to understand that. And that's one of the biggest complaints that we hear from new recruits that we have about their past firms is that there was no transparency and they didn't really understand how the business of design worked. So they're very appreciative and understanding what we're sharing with them. Is there limits to the transparency? Like, you don't, you should, you should everyone know each other's salaries or things like that? Or is that? No, the, yeah, we definitely, yeah, we don't share that. We don't share the sort of the, the, the individuals, although the, the, you know, project managers obviously have a good sense because they know billable rates. And if people really wanted to do the math, they probably could figure a lot of it out. Um, but there's obviously other things that go in there. There's the administrative side, the healthcare costs, the insurance costs, all of those things kind of, we don't, we don't talk about cash. Um, you know, that's, that's something that we only as a ownership group deal with. Um, you know, cash is king, right? You can generate all this revenue. You can have, uh, you can be all these different things on paper, but at the end of the day, sort of the cash in the bank is really kind of how it works and, and what keeps the, you know, keeps the lights on. And so we don't really go into that. That's something that we just deal with sort of, we don't want to burden anybody with stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Great. Um, We've got some more questions here from the, from the audience. Sean. Hi there. This is Sean Luttrell with Luttrell Architecture. I've got a small firm here in Tampa, Florida. My question is for, for Bola. You mentioned uh, early on. Oh, I should have turned this off at the beginning. No, no, you're good. <laughs> you mentioned early on how you work pretty closely, it sounded like, with project managers and how you kind of make sure the project stays successful. Can you just give me an idea of the, the process, how intimately involved you are, and what that process looks like in general? Of course. So um, the way I like to think about it, or, or the way I like the project managers to think about it, is in terms of rhythms, right? So um, what information can I produce for you from accounting, either on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, that can help you manage your projects better? Um, so one of the very first things I did when I joined the firm now, oh my God, five years ago, was... Uh, to instill a weekly um, accounts receivable meeting where we're going over what your client owes you, what's the status, how are we following up on um, collecting on these invoices that you've issued. Um, what we realized really quickly is that the moment we start developing relationships with our clients, right, people pay people, so you're not just sending out an invoice and, and then not asking for your money, we started to see an improvement on our payment process. Um, the other thing that we do on a monthly basis, right, outside of once you've completed the monthly invoice process, um, the project accountant is sitting down with the project manager to go over project earnings, right? So like, what is the work in progress on your projects? 
how can we, um, what are the actions that we're taking either to recover that money? Because if you don't, if you have all this time you're holding, that's money that, um, revenue that you can invoice to your clients that you're not either um, paying attention to or just letting fall through a black hole, right? So there's, there are certain key reports that we're reviewing with you to make sure um, you understand where your project status is and how you move, um, you know, how you're, you're, you're going to go into the next month. Uh, one of the other reports that we do on a weekly basis is something called a time analysis report, right? So you've gone in, you've staffed your projects, now your staff starts working on it, but who is paying attention to where they're charging their time, right? So what time are they charging to the billable projects? What time are they not charging to non-billable projects? And asking the questions why, right? So if you had planned someone to work, say, 20 hours on a, uh, on bill sorry, 40 hours, we want them working full, but they end up showing, you know, 20 hours billable and then the rest not, it, it helps you ask questions. Why? What happened? Because in, in, in the long run, all of those tie into one, how your project is performing, are there issues coming up, or, or are they doing really well, right? And is your project now going to end up, um, uh, maybe you thought initially that you would spend 100 hours working, I, I like to think in dollars, but I'll talk hours. Let's say you thought you were going to spend 100 hours, but you ended up spending less. What did the team do successfully? Um, to, to, to make sure that they finish the project on time or earlier than what you had initially planned? And then how can you roll that into your uh, into other projects? So it's more so not just interacting with, um, you know, the project managers once a month, but throughout the course of the month because then it allows you react faster if you need to make changes either with your project plan or with the client or whatever the case may be rather than, than acting four weeks out, you know? So those are some other things that you, you should begin to, if you don't have that currently, you should begin to think about like what are the things, what are the areas in which uh, we're lacking financially and how can I either pull my accountant or bookkeeper or whatever, whoever it is that's watching numbers. If it's you, you want to put in that financial hat <laughs> either at the end of the week and then just say like, these are the things that I'm going to be focusing on every week. So I understand, um, the financial position and health of my company. One of the things I really appreciate about appreciate about Bola and how she operates and what her group does is that for years, um, in my experience, the accounting group was always these evil overlords in which you would have to grovel and you know hope for an audience where you wouldn't get screamed at. Whereas you know Bo and her group are really a part; they're really partners with all the project managers and all the staff, and they and and, and they. Ex they bring things to everybody in a way they can understand. Again, we're architects, right? Like, I like books with pictures. So, like, I, you know, spreadsheets like this, my eyes glaze over a little bit sometimes. And Bo has really done a great job at uh, making that accessible to our, our architectural staff. Brilliant. Thank you. Great answer. Um, Jonathan. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Bola, my question's for you as well, and it's kind of a three-part question. Why? You just, had before, a choice. just before you, Jonathan, just before you, do you oh, sure. to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, I'm sorry. Jonathan Card, we've got a six-person firm in San Antonio. Everybody right now is contract, so everybody's trying to figure out how to navigate post-COVID, but we were already working in a remote situation anyway. Some of our employees are out of town, and we probably will continue to do more of that. Um, but as we grow, I, I'm very interested in trying to find someone that can help with the business side of this. And my question is for Bolo as well. What, what, what attracted you as a business-minded person to architecture? What size firm um, do you think, how, what's your feel for the size of a firm would need to be to bring on someone full-time in your capacity or someone like you? And where would I go to start to build that network to meet people like you? <laughs> sure. Um, so, first question: What attracted me to this industry? I um, I was in college, uh, close to graduation, and I needed to find work anywhere. Um, I was an international student who moved here from Nigeria, and needed to find work experience. The finding myself into this industry was by pure luck. <laughs> And I say that um, in a sense that I was looking for work, like I think in the New York Times classified, I happened to stumble on a junior project accountant role. And I had taken technical drawing in high school. 
<laughs> I had this big TD board, TD square, and I said, oh, I think it'll be interesting to work here. I had no, like, that was my connection to the industry. And so um, in 2007, I ended up applying. I actually studied mathematics um, as my first and second degree. Um, and when I went for the interview, the person who interviewed me also studied math. And that's how I got the job. So that I, I, that's how I landed in here. I say it was very serendipitous. But essentially, what ended up ended up happening for me is finding a home here and building a career within the industry. Right? I, I got my job. I didn't know anything about it. So I spent a lot of time learning about projects, learning about how I can provide value to the PMs, um, learning about how uh, accounting in the industry worked. Um, so my first job, I believe, was at HLW, which is where I know Christian from. Christian used to be the director of architecture there, but we didn't interact a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I moved on uh, to... Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, right? Because I said if I was going to spend all my time here, I needed to see how accounting was done at a different firm. So all of my experience has literally been on the job. And I think that is my differentiator, right? So you, they could have gone and hired a CFO, a controller from any other industry. But I think the, the uniqueness for me is because I spent... 10 years really understanding the industry, working on all different sizes of projects. And so I was able to bring all of that knowledge in addition to you know, the accounting and finance that I had done um, to my position. Second question, tell me the second question again. When is the right time? Yeah, what's your gut feeling about what this right size of a firm is to dedicate that overhead to someone like yourself? Yeah, so I would say, um, one, first of all, I believe every business owner should understand um, how the financing, finances and accounting works in your organization. So even before you go hire someone, I think you just need to understand, again, in your own, in your own way, in the language you understand, how money flows in and out of your business. And so I think... Uh, the first thing, regardless of our size, what I did with these folks was just to educate them um, why, how the business works from a financial perspective. So even before you go hire someone, um, that's the first thing you need to understand. Now, in terms of when you should hire, um, I would say if you're a six-person firm, maybe you're not hiring a CFO, but you're hiring a bookkeeper or someone who you need um, to pay attention to your numbers. When you don't have time to do that, because work is building up um, you know, with your clients and work is increasing and you notice that you do not have, uh, you're not able to craft out that time to really and truly do the accounting, get your invoices out on time, that's when you need to hire a bookkeeper. You need to hire a bookkeeper or an accountant. You can also um, consider hiring a fractional CFO, so you might not be able to, uh, from a revenue perspective, afford to go hire a full-time CFO. I wouldn't even encourage that because it's just going to eat into what you're trying to build, right? If you're a six, if you're a, a two to three person firm, six person firm, or under 10, you're still trying to scale up, so it financially doesn't make any sense to hire someone like me full time, but you're able to find part time CFOs now who can come in and support your business um, either um, monthly or, or whatever the case may be, depending on your needs. Um, so, so, so that's when I think I, I, I don't necessarily think it might have to do with uh, your number, but like if you can't dedicate that time, then you need to have somebody who's watching your numbers for you. Um, but there are different levels though, right? So at a, certain, at a certain firm size, maybe you need a bookkeeper, but then as you're growing, you now need a, a project accountant or a controller. And then depending on how large you want to get, then you might need to hire a CFO where you really need someone to help um, when it comes to defining the financial vision, the financial strategy, what, what decisions you, sh you should be making. Uh, now, where to go find folks... <laughs> Where to go find folks like me? Um, honestly, uh, one, it's, it's, aisle 17. <laughs> <laughs> one, it's very hard to find um, 
folks who do project accounting work in general, right? In, in all the different firms that I've worked at, a lot of us either fall into it, right? Like I, I didn't study accounting in school, but I, I ended up in the industry. Other accountants either maybe left um, public work to come into private. Um, but I know like, for example, like the fractional CFOs or fractional controllers or bookkeeping services, they're a lot online you're able to either um, search, like the words that I'm, I'm saying, either like search for a fractional accounting firm that can come in and help you do the bookkeeping services. Um, and that, from a cost perspective, is cheaper, right? Because you don't want to perhaps um, bring them on full time. You just want them to come in a couple of hours a week. So you're able to find, find that. Um, I have a platform called She Builds Money where um, one, I share financial resources. So you guys should check that out. There are free um, information on there as to what you should be looking at either. I have something called a finance task at a glance um, that, that helps you as a business owner know what you should be looking at either on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis. So that's a good starting point. And I, I'm trying, if we can get out of this global pandemic, <laughs> and hopefully not enter into World War III. Um, I'm trying to sort of build that community, right, where um, other accountants um, or finance men and people within the industry can plug into and can now be sort of like a directory for folks like you who are looking for people to plug into and, like, hire someone. Amazing. Thank you. That was worth the price of admission. Thank you. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Um, Mark, Mark, Chad, and then Lisa. Yeah, I've got a follow-up on the discussion we had earlier about transparency, and specifically about transparency with profit. Are you defining profit after you've compensated yourselves? Because it seemed to me if you're transparent about the profit, then you're exposing your compensation to all the employees. There's ways of doing it a little more vague than that, <laughs> or vaguely, I should say. Um, but yeah, you know, we um, profit is profit, right? It's 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 it takes into account all the expenses of the organization. So we we, we do define it after um, you know ownership expenses. It's before distribution or anything like that, for right. sure. Right. Anything else on that, Mark? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still a little curious for you to elaborate further, because uh, the, the way we structure or we distribute our profits is uh, salary, and then we have distributions, uh, quarterly at minimum, oftentimes monthly, and... So it's, so it's very high level, right? So we have our, for example, how we share that we have revenue goals for, for the year, so we, we pick three key metrics that we're sharing with the staff. Um, what revenue or billings that we've, we've done within the current month, what our operational expenses are, and what the profit is uh, um, after we, you know, once we do the calculation. So we're not saying, we're not sharing like our income statement, but we're making it real high level where we're just sharing those three items and how we're progressing towards our goal. So they're not saying, they're not seeing salary, they're not seeing um, how much you pay in rent, right? We don't want them to necessarily start, um, one, like, like Christian had mentioned, um, either be concerned or have fears, but it's more so this goal that we set at the start of the year, how are we progressing towards it um, month by month? And so that's what they see. You, you can share it more on a, a um, high level uh, format where you're not going into um, every single detail of what makes your income statement. I hope that helps. It does. I think Bill mentioned, or one of the, maybe Christian, that uh, ambitious people could do the math on some of those metrics. And come <laughs> so. Yes. Like if we, and and that and and that is outside of even the information that we're sharing at these monthly meetings, right? You during the course of running the business day to day, if you're build, if you're seeing, um, you know, billing rates, yes, you can do that, right? That even goes outside of what's sharing. Like if whether or not we were sharing that. Um, 
sharing, you know, like our our revenue goals. Like they can fi- they can try and figure that out. A- any firm with a significant number of employees, um, folks can look at the bill rates and kind of back into what their what salaries are if they really want to. Yeah, and and this goes across board, like outside of Mancini, even at SOM where I worked, um, you know, every at the start of the year, you know, rates are issued, and project managers are working with these folks' rates, so you can kind of figure out where people fall into. Um, I think it's just thinking about what is the goal of why you're being transparent <laughs> and and how can you share um, how can you pick which metrics to share that can help them understand where you're working towards great thank you very much um, Chad hey everybody um, my name is Chad Polk I'm the president of CDP architecture in Nashville Tennessee and we're a eight person generalist architecture firm. We do both um, commercial and residential, high end residential architecture. And so my question was, I believe I heard uh, someone mention uh, a couple different services that you offer. Uh, one was the design lab and then a tool belt, I think somebody mentioned. Um, and then I know interiors and architecture, could you, kind of explain those different um, services that you offer? Yeah, sure. So we so we are organized very traditionally as a traditional design firm, right? We have several market sectors from <clears throat> corporate interiors work uh, to obviously the restaurants, hospitality, um, and we do a lot of building repositionings, especially in New York City. Uh, we just actually did Boca Ria, which is a fifth in Broadway, right by, right by you there in Nashville. Um, very cool restaurant. Um, and so we've got these different, you know, the, the, the airport work, the, we've got all these different vertical markets that we do. On top of that, we have what's called, we have an R&D um, a lab, which we call the design lab. <clears throat> and that design lab is a, it's actually a physical room. It's now in multiple, in, in, in our other offices, it's in multiple offices. And that's a place where, from an R&D point of view, we have developers. Um, they are architecture um, trained as architects, um, and they uh, one one particular person you know, teaches at Pratt. We've got some others that uh, teach at Penn. There's a, a series of of developers in this lab, and they are helping assist on the technology side with projects, but then also develop software for us. So we've developed out of that R and D lab a software that we call the Tool Belt. Um, and there actually is a website uh, for the tool belt. It really is, it's something that we're going to be, now that we we recently have it, uh, it's patent pending. And so therefore we are now allowed to kind of move forward with it as a software. And what that is, is it's a streamlined version of our own rendering software. So uh, it's connected to Revit or Rhino as really a third party uh, plugin that it's its own rendering engine, as I said, and when the designer is working in Revit, it's automatically creating a VR experience uh, directly in this tool belt software. And that can be a VR experience where you are actually putting on the VR headset and you're walking around uh, in VR, or we also have a multi, what we call the multiplayer version of it. And that is where, you know, we can, you know, everyone on the Zoom call can have a link and jump into the Revit model and actually have an avatar version of themselves and we can have a virtual meeting within the Revit model. Uh, And and so that obviously there's a series of tools, we call it the tool belt because when you look down, you get a series of tools around your waist uh, and you can manipulate the model at that point. So you can uh, change materials, you can obviously move through through the model itself um, you can make, uh, you know, do measurements. You can actually build uh, additional uh, primitives within the, within the software itself. Um, and then I think, you know, most importantly, kind of have a record of all of that going forward. So our projects go through this process. So every project that we do is designed, let's call it, in the lab. So as we, as we engage, uh, like for instance, that, that, that Bocaria restaurant in Nashville literally was exactly in this process where the owner came in pre-lease, we did a virtual walkthrough with him with sort of component parts, very rough whitewashed version 
uh, in, in the tool belt software. He looked around, he said, okay, this, this looks like it'll work. He went to lease. And then each step of the way, we develop that model further and further. We don't print a single piece of paper. We don't do a rendering. It's all a byproduct of this process. So that owner comes in on a weekly basis and sees the evolution of his design from start to finish. And we're also not throwing away a bunch of work that we've done, right? We're not creating a, 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 a bogus 3D model and rendering version. We're at, because it's doing, it's connecting Revit or Rhino into our software, it's become its own. Uh, it, we, that Revit file exists on its own and now becomes the construction documents and ultimately all the way through to the, to the final package. Um, and we can even do post, kind of post work with that. So that's so, kind of it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, so as Christian said, we don't want to print anymore. And so the way that we're presenting to them, you know, the way that you would typically do it, or we did it even three years ago, is that you print this deck and you're presenting the deck to them and, and progressing through the deck. We do it all within the model. So when I'm walking around presenting to the client, we're presenting the big ideas from whitewash, you know, all the way through and we start to layer in concepts within the space, the big architectural volumes, start layering in all the finishes, the furniture, the lighting. So I'm literally walking around in the model with the client presenting to them within that 3D environment. So we're able to you know, point to things, we're able to move things. So it really becomes this interactive process of presenting to them. And, and we're really getting very close to our goal of not having to anymore and our, our big hairy goal is that we don't have to print CDs anymore. We'd love to not to have to present construction documents. We'd love to present to the DOB within the same immersive environment, get our building permit and, and never print anything. One day we'll get there, hopefully. <laughs> but we've, we've been able to successfully do it through our design process, and it's worked out very well because the clients can see everything that you're talking about in first person. So they're understanding everything because they're a part of everything. That's, that's great. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, we use Revit with Enscape, and um, mm -hmm. we present the exact same way. All of our client design meetings, we have sort of a, a VR presentation area where we have the Oculus headset, they can put that on, or we can just present it on a big screen TV and, and run them through the video. Of course, it's so much different in the environment versus sitting in a chair looking at the screen, as you guys know, um, but we haven't gotten to the point where they're picking their tools and, <laughs> and doing some of those. It sounds pretty pretty cool and interactive. So when is this uh, gonna be available for us to purchase these set? That's something we're honest. You could send us a note, and, and we, we are looking for beta testers because we're trying to kind of get it to the next level. Um, and you know, just as transparent as we've been on this podcast, right, we're, we're figuring that process out, right? We, we developed something, we've patented something, we've got a website and software, we know it's got value. Now we need to really you know, figure out how to bring it to market, test it, kind of kick the tires on it. And, and we use Inkscape, we use, we use Lumion. The difference here is the ability to manipulate that model, but also you're working you're working in Rhino and Revit in terms of textures, and those are all coming in to our rendering engine. You're not doing post-production, so we're trying to limit that that post-production side of things, right? It's right. We, we go this whole, you know, you wait, we architects and designers, we waste so much time kind of getting every little thing right, right? And and then we we got it perfect for this presentation. And that's great, but now that exists only in a presentation, now we got to go back and do it yet again, you know, and, and pick up those comments or do it for real now in whatever construction documents we're doing to ultimately get this thing built. And so how do we marry those two and not go down this road of, you know, kind of wasting time? I think the, the thing that you mentioned starting with the whitewash is super important because clients, when they come in and they see something for the first time fully done, they're like, well, that's not what I was thinking that material was going to be, you know, so you can kind of build on that and understand where they, um, where the, the design evolves. So I, I like that. Well, we'd love to be a, a, a beta tester. We'll, we'll, we'll send something out to you. Yes, but we're kind of already yeah. moving in that direction and we want to be on that bleeding kind of cutting edge too. So I love that. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, All right. And um, Lisa. Hi, thanks, Ryan. 
Hi, my name is Lisa. I am a sole proprietor. I work in Westchester, New York. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, by the way. It's really fascinating to hear from you guys. My, my question is really about the design lab and the R&D and how originally now it seems like you have these um, actual you know, things that you've developed that you can pitch that are really integral to your process. But when you were first starting these ideas, were they sort of internally funded as, you know, as you as leaders funding these things or are your project fees helping you fund the R&D? Um, obviously, you have this one product now, but you're probably continuing to do R&D and additional um, research and development. I'm just wondering in the firm how you fund those things and whether your project fees, you can command higher fees because you're able to pitch these really superior products. I'm just wondering how that works over time, how you can support your R&D and also keep your fees where they should be. It, it was internally funded. And when we first started it, actually, Christian gave up his office um, to have our first VR arena, I don't know how many years ago. But um, we've actually found that we don't need to charge extra for these because it does save us. It actually saves us time. It, it, it enhances the decision-making process, which we all know, you know, can waste tons and tons of time on things. So it's not something that we upcharge for, and, and, and it's all been historically internally funded. That was one of the benefits that, you know, of us buying this firm years ago was that we could do things like this, and we didn't have to, like, you know, bow to the feet of a bunch of old guys to beg for money to do stuff because it was our, our, our show to run. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, one of the important parts is it, you know, Ralph Mancini used to say to us, you know, you got to stand out when you go into a room. I think I might have said this in, in the previous podcast. When, when you go into a room, I don't care if you show up naked, you've got to stand out. You've got to separate yourself somehow. And all along, I, you know, we've been searching for, you know, well, what is that, right? What is it that we do? Yeah, we're young. Yeah, we're cool. We do great design, all of that sort of stuff. But quite frankly, a lot of people do that, right? And, and you know, one of my passions was technology, and that's kind of become, you know, what uh, one of the, the main things that we do and how do we get the other staff excited about that which we were able to do as well and so yes we've internally funded all of this but a lot of it ends up becoming it, it's almost become a marketing effort in a sense right so if we were to really boil down a lot of the hours we probably could say well we won this project because of our process or because of the software or because we talked about it on a podcast or whatever it might be there are ways that we've been able to kind of parlay that into something else. We've also set financial goals for the R&D facility itself that the, 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 the design labbers, let's call them, uh, are, to, are really looking for ways of bringing in their own revenue. So we've done things with 3D printing where we've gone and we've charged the client for 3D printing. Um, there was a job we actually commanded a $100,000 fee, believe it or not, for 3D printing. Uh, we printed uh, 26,000 individual letters that we custom designed and installed them for a signage that we did at a school in, in Long Island. Um, so there are, we're, we're always looking for ways, can this design lab, you know, create its own revenue source and supplement everything? But then also from, a, again, a, an ownership perspective, if we invest now, and we get these things to where we want to be, then 20 years from now, you know, they're having, they're paying back their dividends along the way. There is a lot of research and development that goes along with projects as well. So as we're designing something in a project and we'll say, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could just take a note right here so that then when the client goes into the model later and they want to see the notes that we've left for them or they want to leave us a note, they can do so, things like that. Or wouldn't it be great if we could measure? So as we were going through the projects, we would think of tools that we need specific to that project. And some of it would happen kind of in conjunction with the project fee for things that we needed to develop for that specific project that then have just become part of the, the kit of parts on the tool belt. Yeah, and our most recent one is that, um, you know, we found that a lot of clients, if we were to do it interactively where they're not going to come to the office or we're going to do a remote session, they don't want to download a piece of software to their, um, to their laptop or to their computer. Um, so our developers have now made a web portal version of our software only, which my understanding is we're pretty close to finalizing. And so now that software is a completely browser-based web piece of software where you're now bringing your model into it and you're able to do all the same connectivity that you'd normally do. But again, that's that's kind of trial and error, right? Oh, they, nobody wants to download the software. Oh, that stinks. Okay, so now how do we figure that out? 
and, and really, again, the success of all of it um, is really about the buy-in about everybody here and everybody in our staff. Because if we don't believe it, in, believe in it, if we don't use it, uh, Christian mentioned as a marketing tool and something to differentiate, it doesn't it doesn't succeed. And the guy who runs that lab is a genius. Just I want to put that out there. He's not mm-hmm. here. One day he will be at this table. So um, you know, he's he's really taken that to a completely different level than we ever would have expected. Brilliant. I think that's, that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation there. Um, so Christian, Bola, Scott, William, and Jessica, thank you very, very much. Everyone just please a big... BOA round of applause, raise the roof as it were here. Excellent, thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.